Explorations presents Amateur Hour. Hey everybody, welcome to Explorations Amateur Hour. It's Rob, Ian, and Damon with you here. And tonight we are talking about the Dempster Highway and the Inuvik Tuktaktuk Highway. Uh, as I'm sure you have probably noticed, we have been uploading our Arctic trip. And by the time this comes out, we will have just uploaded the episode where we finally finished those two amazing, awesome highways. So we thought we would talk about it. Um, we did actually record like a debrief to be included as part of the series, but um, our audio screwed up, so here we are doing it now. So we're going to discuss sort of our experience. We're going to talk about uh, what to expect if you're planning a trip like this, give you some some hints and tips from our perspective, and, you know, just kind of have a, a nice discussion about what was a, a really, really good trip in my opinion. So grab a beverage and uh, let's get this, get this going. I, I have one complaint already. Yeah. That was a terrible trip. I had a horrible <laughs> trip the whole time. I think the worst was the company. I yeah. was with, like... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you... Choose your friends. Make sure you pick good <laughs> travel partners because some of these characters we went <laughs> yeah. with. My God. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, overall, what, impressions? Yay, nay? Something you would recommend to people? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Sure, yay. <laughs> Yeah, if you're if you are considering doing this trip, um, do it. If you have the opportunity to do it, you should definitely, definitely do it. It was fantastic, and if you're not doing it on a motorcycle, do it in a car. I mean, that's yeah. also good. Well, and that's, or that's one thing I, I definitely want to highlight is uh, just do it. Like, it's not like everyone kind of hyped it up as like this thing where like, oh my god, you need to be like the most extreme, but like. Literally anyone in Canada, I assure you, like maybe some exclusions to that, but like 90% of people can do this. Yeah. It's it's something that you can do and you should do. Yeah, we saw all manners of vehicle on the roads um, doing the whole thing. It's a relatively well-traveled road considering, so it is possible. I mean, obviously making their correct preparation and doing your research before is going to make your trip a lot better, which is the same for any trip, but it is definitely doable. It's not something you should be afraid of. Um, definitely something to, like we said, plan for, but it is doable and highly recommended if you can do it. Yeah. So um, I think we're going to start out, we're going to do a real quick overview of when we did it, how we did it, that kind of thing. And then we'll go into more, trip planning ideas and suggestions for you folks who might be planning on doing this trip as well. Uh, so uh, I'll start us off. I know I've been talking a bunch already. I'll, I'll stop. I'm sorry. I know there's three of us. I've just been yakking the whole time, but go for it. Man. Um, so just, if you haven't been watching the videos, uh, the three of us rode our motorcycles on the Dempster and the, in the Victor Tactic highway uh, last summer, we did it in the end of July I think we were on the highway like the last week of July. Uh, we did have a support car and a trailer. The main reasons for that is my family also joined us and Ian's partner joined us. And they are not motorcycle riders because my kids are nine and my wife doesn't ride a motorcycle. So they, they wanted to join us. They came in a car um, and they did bring a trailer because we were a little tight for time and we couldn't afford delays due to breakdowns. So it was three bikes us three and then a car and a trailer um the vehicles mostly made it we all made it off the highway in pretty much one piece uh we didn't have any real major issues and it was a fantastic time yeah no major issues no major issues uh, <laughs> uh i don't want to say the vehicles made it off unscathed but they were definitely drivable by the end of the highway <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of putting it yeah and which vehicle had the issue will surprise you <laughs> yeah Yes. Hint, hint. It was no one's vehicle that is on the screen right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, basically our itinerary was we did it. We went from the foot of the Dempster to Tuktayaktuk, which is at the end of the Inuvik to Tuktayaktuk Highway. Uh, we did it in three days up and then three days return. Is that correct? And they weren't three full days either. 
Um, we spent two nights in Tombstone, so I mean, actual travel time different because um, we also yes. spent two nights in Tuk Tai Up Tuk. Yeah. So if you look at actual travel time, it was probably like two days up, two days back. Because we kind of had like a half day, a full day, and a half day to tuck, and then the same on on the return trip. Mm-hmm. Um, it is if you're going all the way to Tuk Tayak Tuk, it is 900 kilometers. If you're going just to Inuvik, it's 700 kilometers. But I mean, if you're going to Inuvik, go the rest of the way. Yeah, you can go to the end of the road. It's it's worth it. And I know there's people that do that just as a day trip from Inuvik. They'll make Inuvik their destination, whip up to Tuk Tayak Tuk for the day, and then then come back. That's definitely an option, but. You're looking at and it's such a it's such a different experience like Inuvik is uh admittedly like more of a town than i expected it to be like it's a pretty solid town yes. but like Tuktiuktuk is a hundred percent just like a, a community yeah it's it's really tiny and and really beautiful and quaint and and unique so yes yeah if you're going up check it out for sure yeah those last uh it's not even 200 kilometers i think it's 180 kilometers are very very different from the miles leading up to it so that that stretch of highway past Inuvik the Inuvik to Tuk Highway is very different experience roads were a lot different too the gravel well, I mean it's gravel road but it's a lot more slushy deep loose gravel than the actual Dempster Highway leading up and then once you get into Tuk you have it was the oil that sprayed down onto the ground and so it's a lot more slick it's not like you're riding or driving on asphalt and uh watch that throttle because when i got onto that um the road i was still kind of used to the dempster and um the gravel road and so i opened it up a bit and the back kicked out a little bit once or twice or three times <laughs> yeah yeah and... it is a little slick and maybe that's a good a good segue into the uh, the what to expect. So, when you're on a motorcycle, especially your big concern is the road and the road conditions. So, why don't we talk about the road and the road conditions? At least the conditions that we experienced in July. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they were great. I would say, yeah. uh, as far as uh, leading up to the dumpster, uh, like like what was being said, it was a gravel road, right? So, I think as long as you um, have driven on a gravel road before you'll you'll be fairly safe taking all the same precautions and stuff like that right so there's no lines dividing oncoming and going traffic or anything like that um, it's relatively narrow but not overly so um, so one in one lane each direction and just be mindful of that I think the the most critical thing about that road for me was the dust yes that's probably the craziest part of that whole road and so on the way there uh we we were lucky and fortunate where it kind of rained a bit and kept the dust down a little bit uh for our riding but on the way back we did not have such luck (laughs) and so it was it was some heavy breathing for sure yeah i think um one thing to also note um but semi trucks do also frequent this highway um and more often than not if there's no one around they just drive in the middle right and um if the truckers do see you slow down and give them space they'll do similarly because when the trucks pass by visibility drops to literally nothing in seconds less than seconds and so you'll want to ease off that throttle or i guess if you're driving like slow down like just give them the space because not only will you not have as much room as you like next to a semi truck on this gravel road but you could be going around a bend or something and you're and if you're going at 60 kilometers an hour or something and you don't see where you're going with that dust then it could be dangerous yeah and trucks also kick up rocks so you want to be going slow so if you get hit in a rock or hit in the head or hit in the chest with a rock and you're going at speed and the truck is going at speed it it will hurt and they can also destroy your windshield if you're in a vehicle so keep that in mind uh safety and vehicle and bodily preservation slow down going around trucks <laughs> speaking of uh like slowing down and stuff like that like regular pacing for it like the semis were going fairly quick but overall i'd say the traffic was like relatively calm right like it would be you would have people going cautiously at like 20 to 30 kilometers an hour 
Um, and you would have people going faster than that, admittedly, but but no one was being like aggressive or or intense about it. It was really like it was really uh, calm vibes for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most of the people we passed were, and trucks included, were very mindful of us mm-hmm. and mindful of their surroundings. Trucks would slow down when they saw us coming, for the most part. Not every truck, but you know, for the most part, they did. Yeah, that's one thing I really appreciated was that kind of sense of community in a way like the adventure community um if we're like pulled over taking photos and then like a car kind of comes along and sees the entire convoy pulled over they'll kind of stick their head out like you guys all right they just check in like anything wrong blown tires or whatever the whole sense of community there though was great i i loved it um a little bit more on the on, on the highway itself uh, when we first started um, yeah, like Rob was saying, we had a bunch of rain uh, that helped settle the dust, um, which was also kind of um, interesting to ride on because, yeah, what we read, what I, um, we kind of pulled up and discussed before was when it rains, it literally becomes like a mud highway and it would be really difficult to uh, drive on it. And then when it's dry and it's just a lot of dust, like you can see like the dust trail from miles and miles away. So we experienced kind of the two sides of that, um, where we got the mud at the beginning and then the dust towards pretty much the rest of the time. You touched on two things there. I wanted, I wanted to say as well. Um, these are the conditions we experienced, um, conditions you experience if you go could be very different. One thing we heard and Ian mentioned it briefly was you know when it rains the road is very very dangerous for motorcycles we did not experience that we only had a very little bit of rain and it wasn't raining while we were riding so we can't really speak to how true that is but we have heard it and read it from many different people many different sources so i believe there is some validity to it and um yeah just be mindful of road conditions when you're going and i'm gonna jump into what you said on a planning comment for the rain but there was um one thing i think a little bit of an well at least for me i didn't think about it as a huge influence for the planning but it turned out to be a big consideration were what forest fires and their smoke um apparently after we got out um off the dempster and they closed the highway behind us because the forest fires were getting too intense. Um, and so if you're caught out on that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to kind of con- make contingency planning for a week, but at least like Rob said, build in some days so you can have a little bit more flexibility. I will say though, speaking of like checking weather and, and stuff like that, uh, even on the Dempster, I was surprised at how much phone reception I had. So... <laughs> So like I, I wouldn't necessarily rely on like a an hourly or a, or even like every single day being able to like check your weather forecast, but right before it in Inuvik, in Tuktoyaktuk, there is cell reception. So you can you can kind of plan as you go to a certain extent, or at least update your itinerary a little bit if you think it's getting a little crazy or if it's clearing up or or whatever it's turning into. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. do we want to transition to talking about, like, the remoteness and, like, stops and where you can supply and all that kind of stuff? Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was going to actually um, tag, uh, do a hot pursuit on Damien's comment was, uh, like, even at Eagle Plane, you could get Wi-Fi, right, yeah. uh, for example. Um, but more generally, I think one thing to really do is download offline maps before you head up or when you get the chance Um, because I mean there's one road sure you're not gonna get lost (laughs) I never knew which way I was going the whole time (laughs) yeah I think there's more yeah for, for like right at the junction of like Dempster wherever you're going and like there are places where um yeah, I, I guess that was more for Alaska Highway and, like, where there are more roads. But just for timing and distance-wise, too, if you needed to plan that, I think having um, offline maps would be uh, handy. 
Yeah, and I do want to talk about resources a a little bit later on because there are definitely resources that we would recommend. Um, But yeah, definitely offline maps. There's a couple books that I want to show a little bit later. And it's useful to have these things because, like, yes, it is a straight road, but there's things on the road you want to see. There's um, places you're going to want to pull over and take photos. You want those are coming up. Um, you're getting to know distances to your next campsite, distances to the next gas potential, stuff like that, right? So you, it is a straight road, but maps are still definitely handy. Maps, guidebooks, what have you. So, um, but yeah, the remoteness of it. Um, yeah, it was. It is remote, um, and they're at the campsites. I feel like obviously it's the campsite, so you have a hub of people. But then once you're on the highway you do get the occasional trucks and cars that pass you by um so i feel like if you get off the highway and then you just like it it is remote in that sense but if you're just right on the main thoroughfare um and your car's broken down or something or your bike's broken down i think the likelihood of getting some sort of help is there I feel like in terms of gas planning and remoteness, like we had a lot of jerry cans. I think we over we, um, we overbrought jerry cans, which isn't the worst thing. <laughs> no, but we also had that um, the luxury of the ability to do that. If you're just on mm-hmm. a bike and you don't have a support vehicle, you can't be hauling <laughs> four jerry cans, basically. <laughs> four twenty liter jerry yeah, cans. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, I feel like, yeah, I, again, we didn't necessarily need those jerry cans, right? Like, uh, I don't think we bikes, used them on the Dempster mo- part. Not on the Dempster, no. I, uh, I think, I, well, no, Ian I did. Oh, we did, yes. <laughs> yes, we did once. Yeah, Ian did. Yes, guys, <laughs> Yeah. But I would say, like, for the most part, like, like uh, I can't remember the exact kilometer range. Is it, like, 400 to Eagle Plains? Something like that, I believe. Yes. Um, whatever. Insert the number there. But, uh, yeah, um, we'll insert the number. It's well within the range of a normal vehicle. And some motorbikes, not all motorbikes, but but most motorbikes I've ever had, and and uh, even the Bandit, which is not an adventure bike, right, uh, was, was able to do most of this without any kind of jerry can assistance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I do think he probably would have made it. We filled up when we filled up because we were concerned that if he didn't make it, we didn't want the bikes to die on a corner or just over the crest of a hill or somewhere potentially dangerous. Right. So we also, again, were uh, going the speed limit. So, I mean, I feel like we would have had potentially a little bit more fuel economy if, uh, if we were going under the speed limit. You know, like, um, <laughs> yeah. And just with the remoteness, it. like, uh, we kind of mentioned it a little bit, right? But, like, there's, like, apart from the campsites, there's nothing but views. Like, and, and truly, like, there's, like, these couple of stops we've mentioned that are many hundreds of kilometers apart. And apart from campsites, those are it. There's, there's no, like, uh, there's no convenience stores sitting around. There's, there's yeah. literally nothing between these spots, right? Like, even the campsites were, like, the most bare uh, and mosquito-ridden. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but they, were, they were basically empty, right? Yeah. Like, there was nothing there, no support, no, no nothing. Nothing, yeah. So, uh, yeah, remoteness is something to take into consideration, uh, we were there at like peak tourist season, so the highway was relatively well traveled. There were vehicles going by pretty regularly, I would say. When you get on the highway, there is gas right at the foot of the highway, um, and then your next civilization or pseudo- semi civilization is Tombstone Territorial Park, which is 80 kilometers up, but there's no services there. It's just camping. There's no gas. There's no food. There's no nothing. You don't get your first services until Eagle Plains, which is 400 kilometers. Plains, your next civilization is the Ferry Crossing, the first Ferry Crossing at Fort McPherson. And then you have your second yeah. Ferry Crossing and then Inuvik. Yeah, and, and Fort McPherson, again, is there's nothing there for you, really. So. 
Well, we didn't really... really go into Fort McPherson. I don't know how it's set up. There is a northern store. We did get gas there. So there is a potential to get your basics. Hmm. But Inuvik is the first real civilization where they actually have like a hardware store and a semi outfitter. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you are on motorcycles though, there is no motorcycle support whatsoever on that road or anywhere north of Whitehorse. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, talking about the remote for motorcycles, even before you get to the Dempster, there is nothing north of Whitehorse to support your bike. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, for the most part, like we brought basically everything we would need for these bikes, right? Like, like uh, extra, like tires, inner tubes, especially um, because we knew it would kind of just be like on us to do whatever we needed to do here. Yeah. And make sure you know on how to change note. your tires. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to. <laughs> like in, in case he didn't see that episode yet. yeah yeah <laughs> i don't want to get too too far down the equipment rabbit hole yet because i think we are gonna have to talk about that in a lot more detail later on sure. in this what, what's next like lodging i guess where you're where we're you staying yeah. um i didn't men mean to mention this at the beginning but we we camped the whole way um there's plenty of campgrounds they are spaced out a fairly decent amount but they there are campgrounds uh even in peak tourist season there were still lots of spots available they are first come first serve all of them and they are all um unmanned so you you go you you pay your donation in the little donation box or your fee it's not a donation you are supposed to pay for them um you put your fee in and then yeah that you have your site um apart from tombstone which Tombstone was uh, yeah. it was maintained, right? Tombstone is the only manned park, yes. Yeah, exactly. But all yeah, the which, all, but it's still first place? come first served. It is still first come first served. Yeah. Um, none of the parks, including Tombstone, have water, right? I don't think yeah, Tombstone, Tombstone had, had water. Did Tombstone, Tombstone have water? I yep. think had water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, none of the other parks have water, so you no. consider carrying water or having a way to filter water. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Potable water. Right? Potable. Like there oh was, yes, there's, there's like, yeah. definitely water around. There's creeks around and all that stuff. So yeah. worst case scenario, you can boil some stuff. Um, but that being said, I don't know if I'd want to drink any of the water around. It was very sediment heavy. The water yes. that was there. Yes. So. And if you are planning on doing that for your trip, um, read a little bit more into it than what we're providing you because there are some water bodies on that engineer creek being one of them where they say do not drink that water even with a filter system so um if you are relying on filters or filter bags or something for supplying your water uh make sure you know where your water stops are going to be because it's not all potable even after filtering <laughs> um if you are doing the hotel route um we did not really experience this, but we did hear stories. Hotels are very expensive and they fill up very quickly. And your hotels are only available in Inuvik, Tuktoyaktuk, -tuk, and Eagle Plains. So, yeah. especially they're in, not big. They are not big, and in peak tourist season, they fill up quick. So, be prepared to spend a lot of money and fight for reservations. Yeah. But, I mean, um, you can get a shower, so maybe it's worth it. In Tuck, I think to mention in terms of where to go camp, you have to go all the way down to the end of the road. And then on as you go to the point on the left-hand side, you'll see a whole bunch of people, well, maybe, <laughs> depending on the time you're going. But um, there's this little stretch of kind of emptiness on the left-hand side. That's where you go and camp. But then to register for the camping, you have to go back to the um, essentially the entrance of the town. Yeah, <laughs> where there's the uh, info tourist center, and that's where you register. That was um, very confusing. Yeah, and we found out from the people there, no one comes by to check you, 
um but please do go and pay for your campsite like yeah. don't be an asshole just go pay for your campsite it supports the community <laughs> they do do upkeep there so i mean you're visiting the community you're using the facilities please pay your way um there are a limited number of sites but you don't really camp on a site you camp where there's space yeah so the and, first uh, the first day we were there was incredibly crowded and the second day was almost empty so yeah that's yeah. the difference that 24 hours can make. Yeah. And you'll get a really nice bath in the Atlant um, Arctic Ocean. <laughs> so do that. You have to. You made it all the way out there. You, yeah. you got to. You got to do it. <laughs> as far as campsites, the, the critical thing and, and something that, that was like pretty diverse throughout the, the entire Dempster was there were some spots where it was like beautiful all night, very warm, very peaceful. Tuk 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 is a great example of just like, we can sit outside and watch the sun not set, um, which is great. But uh, Engineer Creek is a great example, was not that. That was <laughs> very, very aggressively mosquito ridden where it was just intense. Like everyone was just in our full head to, head to toe mosquito gear, trying to stay away from them as much as possible. Like it was, it was really harsh. Yes. But Engineer Creek and a couple of the other sites did have shelters. They had yeah. screened in shelters that campers were welcome to use. There's a stove in there. Uh, you can go in and cook and do whatever you got to in there to escape the bugs, which was, I thought that was kind of a nice feature. And uh, there is camping available at Eagle Plains as well. It's not just a hotel. They're, they do offer camping as well. We talked about tires. You want to get into like more of the equipment that we should bring like essentials to have nice to haves um not necessary yeah, i mean for me i i would say one thing that i really thought i would have needed more on the dempster was my garmin i had a garmin in reach uh for for this trip uh because i assumed we were going to be pretty isolated there um but like we've talked about there are lots of vehicles passing by in Eagle Plains, there was data. In Inuvik, there was cell and data. And in Tuktoyaktuk, there was cell and data. So, I mean, it was a nice to have. And, and it was great to get, like, weather updates with, which was really fun. But, but certainly, I didn't feel like at any point I was, like, in need of it. And even if we had an issue, I think we would have been fine without it. Yeah. But again, this is peak, peak season we're talking about. If you're yeah. doing it more shoulder season, mm -hmm. that's probably something you're going to want. Um, at least for like peace of mind, right? Because I don't know how well traveled that road is in shoulder season. True. Yeah, and we were also in a group, in a convoy. Yes, I see it. Even for a motorcycle, in case you like wash out, like and you get really injured, something like having something in the back pocket, like Rob said, as a peace of mind, uh, for me is it would be totally worth it. Great. Well. Yeah. Another <laughs> yeah, I'm, I I I was very glad you brought it. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, you guys go ahead. There was one thing I thought of, but I forgot now. Okay, well, I'll say what I was gonna say because it's not something I really even considered. Um, and it's not to do with motorcycles; it's to do with cars and trailers. Um, if you're bringing a car, definitely have mud flaps on it, and if you're bringing a trailer, even more so because. I'm pretty sure you may have seen in the videos already if you've been watching the videos, but we sandblasted our trailer. We sandblasted the paint off the front of the trailer from just the dust and the stones kicking up for 1,800 kilometers. The paint was just completely stripped off and also um, stones were bouncing off the trailer and then coming back and hitting the car. So, I mean, I know that's something that a lot of RVers that's as obvious to them. We don't tend to tow trailers that much, so it's not something that ever really crossed my mind. Kind of on that same note, we just brought our stock car tires up, the tires that came with the vehicle. They were fine, um, but they did wear out kind of quick towing the trailer, so it probably would have been smart for us to get a more robust, maybe sort of off-road oriented tire. The car tires made it. Uh, we did get one flat on the car, but we think that was because we did something stupid. <laughs> AKA following Damon into a quarry for photo ops. I mean, <laughs> it, 
Maybe that. Maybe it's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, no, it wasn't your fault. It was our fault for wanting to be as awesome as you. I mean, come on, <laughs> doing all this cool stuff in a quarry. <laughs> um, uh, but that was us, you know, being cocky and being like, "Hey, let's do this like super off roading," and then ten minutes later, we have a flat tire. So. <laughs> The one thing I was wanting to share that I found it to be super helpful was an N95 mask because of the dust. Yes. And cool. I brought it originally thinking it was like, oh, okay, it's, you know, we're winding down from COVID just in case we run into like crowds of people when we're sightseeing or whatever. But it helped out for the forest fires and the dust. Like I used it more for that than for actual COVID at this point. Yeah, that, that was brutal. So N95 mask finagle it into your helmet if you can like you'll you'll be pleased that you have it yeah yeah that, that was something i i didn't think of even slightly uh on this trip i was like oh i've yeah, got I know. My, my little like buff that i'll cover my face with if i need to but absolutely those were like critical critical important see i really i didn't wear the n95 on the dempster portion i i only wore it for the forest fire smoke and it's bad like you could feel the dust, even with my my buff. It, like you could feel it in my teeth. Um, oh, like my nose was yeah. just full, full, full. Like it's it's gross. <laughs> uh, any any other like super important equipment that people might not think about? I mean, water purification is always a good idea, just in case you break down. It's probably not a bad idea. Um, but yeah, I think really the big reason why the bandit was able to do it is because I literally had a backpack on the back of the bike. Yeah. Um, so that, that was really helpful. Yeah. We, I will have to admit we were fortunate to, to have a trailer, but the lighter you can pack, definitely the better time you're going to have in terms of riding. So, well, and the lighter bike you'll have, right? Yes. Like, I mean, so we talked to so many people and, and it kind of brings it back to what we were saying before. Like, the Dempster and the Tuck aren't like these intensely difficult roads. They're hard, but they're not something I think you need like this absolute gargantuan of an adventure bike like to do that can handle anything and do anything, right? Like yeah. I I think we like we saw people who were riding dirt bikes. We saw a uh, a couple that was on like a 125cc yeah. little tiny little bike that was so awesome and they probably had the best time yeah <laughs> right like there was i would say number one like uh like for us is yeah like just choosing a lighter bike if you can right like our, our klrs are are about 450 pounds ian your bike was probably around 400 to 450 pounds like these are fairly light as far as uh, an adventure bike would be yeah Oh, no. And on that same note, and I meant to mention this earlier, is you also don't have to be like a dirt rider to ride the Dempster. You don't have to have off-road skills to do it. Like it's a dirt road. Yeah, I would you'll, say you'll... like I don't have off-road skills, as we probably, if you have <laughs> yes. been watching the Arctic ride, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really bad on the dirt. I yeah. think I'm an okay rider, but everywhere in the dirt, I was. I'm falling the whole time. We're, we're all um, learning. We're all learning dirt riding. But but the Dempster was a great place to learn. Like I admit, like I learned literally throughout that ride how to ride better off road. And that was an incredible part of it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the one probably uh, tip for for that part of of the riding, I would say, um, not not tip, but yeah, recommendation. At least watch one or two videos of how to ride in gravel. I'll, I'll say that much. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah don't like, don't go do in. To... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You don't need to have that experience a background of like um dirt biking or whatever um yeah like like we we're all just talking about we came into this without a whole bunch of dirt riding experience and we came out of it with uh more very minimal <laughs> breakage on the bikes yeah <laughs> yeah the better the better you are at riding the better of a ride you're going to have obviously but yeah. Don't let it dissuade you 
I guess that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. Like, don't don't not do the trip because you've never ridden a single track trail on a on your bike. Yeah, um, we kind of commented on like what things we thought were really, um, you know, not important. Uh, what was our like most important thing we brought on on this? My Each bike. other. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <that's nice. laughs> yeah. Um, Go to attitude. <laughs> yeah, you know it. Uh, the most important thing. What was something that you the were bug, like? Oh, the man. bug suit. Yeah. The bug suit. <laughs> I I wanted the bug suit. Um, uh, yeah, the the bug suit, man. Like head to toe, I would still be wearing my armored pants, my gloves, my motorcycle gloves, as well. Like, and you just hear like, <laughs> like it was brutal so a bug suit was so so helpful well i mean to speak of the luxuries we had i was really happy um similar vein to the bug suit but we had uh like a shelter yes uh, the bug shelter trip, right yeah um so when we were in camp like yes we had bug suits um and that was really important to have but like we also had a shelter that we could set up around a picnic table or two picnic tables, depending on the size of them. And we were able to actually hang out together still and not be as attacked. Yes. Right. Like I think, I think those bug suits would, were still very important, but boy, howdy, did they get some help? <laughs> yeah. Cause I think if I was just relying on the bug suit, I would have had a much, much worse time. I think for that. Without the bug shelter, we would have been using the shelters in the campsites more, more. So than we did. Uh, any any tips, tricks, suggestions for people who are planning this trip from you guys? Must must haves, must sees, must dos. I my must... big takeaway. For, oh, sorry. Uh, my big takeaway for this was uh, when I go back. I really want to dedicate some serious time to Tombstone. Tombstone looks absolutely stunning. It's like, again, it's fairly well put together. It's in manicured and, and it has running water, which is nice. Um, and there's just so much exploration that you can do there. So many mountain passes and hikes and trails and things like that that you could do. I'd love to go back to Tombstone. I'm constantly thinking about that place. If you are just on the one solo trip uh, for yourself, plan out the gas, the gas range um, of your bike. Know that you won't need too many jerry cans. <laughs> I mean, we we had four 20 liter jerry cans, so we you you probably won't need that many. No. Um, so few few at ease at that on the gas stops. They they are around, but. Not to say don't go in blind. Um, on the gas note, though, yeah. you can't always count on the gas being there or working when you arrive. So keep yeah. that in mind as well. Also true. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I have a, a, a definite tip in general for motorcycles specifically that was huge for me on this. Um, and that was like, for me, uh, more than anything for riding the Dempster was lean forward, stand on your mm. peg and lean forward. Like I, when I, again, as an amateur dirt biker, when I, we were on the Dempster at first, I was sitting in my seat and just chilling. And that let no weight over the front tire. And it would just flip flop, go crazy, uh, have a really bad time. And I was not having a, a comfortable or controlled ride but the moment i just went you know what let's commit to this and i just stood up on my pegs and leaned as far forward as i could the bike immediately became a whole different world of comfortable yeah so i think for me the four main things really is time budgeting um planning your entry and exit strategy um, like I mentioned earlier, maybe dropping off some gear off. If you're doing a long haul trip across the continent, drop some gear off and then do the Dempster and come back and pick up the rest of the stuff. Um, and also the mechanics, um, if you need to swap tires or even 
Um, make sure your bike's all good after the Dempster. Uh, plan those pieces out because if you're going back through Whitehorse, there's really only the Yamaha dealership that can really help you out. Um, yeah, and then just having some sort of in emergency contingency backup, uh, like the inReach that Damien had and where I felt super safe about. Yeah, so uh, my tips, which the first one is, I think you've both already touched on it, but I'm going to reiterate because it's important, and that is time. Uh, give yourself as much time as you possibly can on the Dempster and the ITH and that part of the trip. Uh, for two reasons, the first one being contingency days, as Damien and Ian have both mentioned. You don't know what's going to happen in regards to weather, in regards to your vehicle, in regards to your own health. Um, plan for contingency days. We heard stories of people being stranded in Inavik or even Whitehorse for weeks waiting for parts. Um, so have contingency days, have an escape plan even as well, right? You don't know what's going to happen. But the other part of that time is it's a super beautiful, unique area and you want to have the time to see the things that you went to see, right? It's something that not a whole lot of people get to do and you want to experience that as much as possible. And that that is one of my big regrets on this trip is that we didn't have enough time for that part of the trip because there was so much more we wanted to see. Tombstone, we do, we, there's so much more to see in Tombstone. Um, it would have been cool to explore Inavik more. Um, Tuk Tayak Tuk, like we didn't, we hardly did anything in Tuk Tayak Tuk because we were constrained by time. So time is the biggest thing. That's my biggest thing is take as much time as possible to do it. Uh, my second big uh, suggestion is um, this book here. This is The Milepost. I kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. This is not just for the Dempster Highway. This is all for Northern America, basically. It's Alaska, Yukon, British Columbia, Alberta, Northwest Territories. It's literally milepost markers for all of the major roads and highways. This is not going to show up well on the camera at all. But it's got maps. It's got information. It's got all your lodgings. And it's got the mile markers where these things can be found. So it's really easy to plan a trip using this kind of resource. Um, on the Dempster, it tells you, hey, you know, at mile 120, there is this thing to see. At mile 135, there is this. Expect this at mile 140. So it makes planning really, really easy. I highly suggest, if not the mile post, something similar. Get a good guidebook. Yeah, no, that book was awesome. Yeah. I, I very much enjoyed that. Like, uh, yeah. just to be able to read it, you know, it gives like, Again, like for things you wouldn't even consider like, oh, at mile 38, here's a paragraph explaining why that's a cool place. Yes. You know, on on the route, nothing explained to you. You're just going to see like whatever, like, oh, a turn off here. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's it. But, but that book really went into the details, which is really cool. Yeah. Like in Tombstone, it said like at mile marker, what was it? Or kilometer marker, I guess. It was like 90 or something. It was like, look at this peak. This is a spot where you might have a chance of seeing like big horn sheep between this month and this month of the year. Mm -hmm. Like it's super, super specific. And it also, like I said, provides phone numbers for hotels, for gas stations, for repair. It gives you all the local resources, tells you where everything is. And it's, it's updated annually. So there will always be a recent copy explaining what you're going to be experiencing on the road ahead so definitely definitely something i recommend <laughs> but um anything else you you want to add to this dempster ith discussion before we before so we wrap this up good it was so good it was so good yeah yeah just do it do it do it just do it yeah just do it <laughs> everything about it take whatever I, we say this all the time. Everything's an adventure bike. Everything is an adventure car. Just literally do this. Whatever vehicle you have right now, even if you have to rent something, just go. It's so amazing. Oh, my goodness. Don't tell the rental company well, if you're renting something. <laughs> <laughs> Doing it again. Yeah. It was, a, it was an amazing experience. I highly recommend it to anyone who is considering it. But, uh, yeah, I hope, I hope you guys found this helpful. Um, definitely, please follow feel free to reach out in the comments or with our email. If you have any questions, we, 
we love talking about this obviously we are happy to help you out in any way we can uh give you suggestions guide you more specifically towards what you're looking for um ian put together a really really good piece on our website so please check that out it describes a lot of what we talk a lot about what we talked about tonight and even went a little bit beyond that so that was that's a really good read and yeah there's lots of resources out there um definitely check them out and do it do the trip it's fantastic um but that is going to be it for us for this i think because we have gone way way over time but uh we really appreciate you guys watching and hopefully it helps you out and helps you get out to tuck tuck and innovic and see all of that awesomeness but thanks so much for watching this episode guys we were hope you're enjoying and we're hope you're enjoying the arctic ride Please give this video a like and subscribe. If you are enjoying it, it helps us out a lot. And we will see you in our next one. Cheers. <laughs>